Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Well, how exciting was that, huh? That first performance by Francis. My goodness. Thank you so much, Francis. I, um, Mark asked me who I wanted to open for me, and then I like deep dove the internet and came up with a, a list of top three. Francis was on the top, and I handed that over to Mark. I said, make it so. <laughs> yeah, and he, he's like, we got him. And I was like, okay, nice. So I'm so psyched. Thank you so much. It really got me pumped. I don't know about you guys. It got you pumped too. Um, but when Mark first asked me to come speak at Creative Mornings today, uh, he called me up and said, Penny Lane, August theme is critical, and I immediately thought of you, you'd be perfect. <laughs> I thought, wow, critical. That is what's absolutely important, essential, integral, I thought. Oh. To be thought of this way by Creative Mornings and by Mark? Wow, so flattered um, and a little bit surprised. So then I did an internet search, as one does, and uh, Google defines critical as um, to criticize severely and unfavorably, <laughs> judgmental, disapproving, persnickety. Ah, I thought it all makes sense now. <laughs> Everything lines up. Mark must have heard about all those people I made cry during consults. Uh, I don't know how word got out about that. Um, but be that as it may, I'm still very honored to be here. And again, it does make, make sense because it's not all tears. Um, being critical has really been not only my business, my, my day and my night job, but uh, really tied to my identity um, and also my way of life. So to illustrate, as a young child, uh, I remember having two or three versions of the same childhood drawing, okay? Like nothing exceptional, your standard kid stuff, uh, a, there you go, right? A cat with extra long whiskers, a Christmas tree, uh, that sort of thing, a rainbow. And, Many of them were numbered on the side, right? Number one, number two. And, you know, I didn't really discover this until a little bit later when I came home uh, and as a teenager and saw this, like, curious letter E in the corner here. E, I thought. Who the heck is E? Well, that was a three. Three. Three drafts of the same thing. How many four-year-olds do you know that are making additions? <laughs> Okay, so the message was clear. I was a psycho type A kid who was already a critic at four, but of myself. Um, so, I, curiously, there weren't very many ones and twos in there, likely destroyed in shame or rage, right? <laughs> Probably. Um, but I hope this illustrates how being critical and critique seems to have always been tied to my identity. So it's really boggled my mind why I got into the business of critiquing fine art. Because of all the different types of arts, you know, that fall under the umbrella of the arts, visual art is by far the most frustrating to critique. And why is that? Because it's so gosh darn subjective. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, yada, 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 that stuff, right? So they say. So think about it, in all the other forms of art, um, we have clear grading systems, ways to judge what's good or bad, and to, and to identify and speak relatively confidently about those things, whether they're good or bad. Think about music, okay? In music, of course, our tastes are different. They shift and change from here to there, but we can actually hear when the notes are played wrong or when the instrument or singing is off key, we can hear that right away. And even when the notes are played wrong and then they're, they're strung together in an intentional sequence, we call that experimental jazz. <laughs> or rough jazz, as I like to call it. Uh, as a side note, my partner Connor, who is sitting right here, who you'll hear a lot about today, uh, he likes his jazz extremely smooth, like dolphin's belly smooth. And I like my jazz much rougher than that. But, uh, so it kind of drives me nuts, but I do understand that it is good. Like, I, I can hear that it's good. Um, so in acting or theater, probably one of the 
easiest ones to distinguish whether it's good or bad when we see it. Very little subjectivity. Um, and if you're not sure what bad acting looks like, might I remind you to take a look back at the 1995 erotic drama Showgirls <laughs> for a little revisiting of what bad acting looks like. Dance. Now, dance is another e easily distinguishable medium, right? We've all seen good or bad dancing. Um, when we think of a good dancer, we, a couple things come to mind. Strong choreography, strength, poise, grace. And well, bad dancing, may I refer you to, again, Elaine from Seinfeld, okay? Or, you know, again, pretty much every wedding I've gone to with my partner, Connor, who has been described as a skeleton being electrocuted or a disoriented mime. <laughs> Sorry, honey, thank you very much for being a good sport. Poetry. Poetry is a bit more of an ambiguous one, uh, but still identifiable when it's bad. Like, how? Uh, well, probably because many of us have <laughs> written some bad poetry. I know I certainly have. Uh, or received some bad poetry, right? Um, and, you know, cliché and convention, they're all kind of red flags, but uh, even things that make up the poem, like the spelling or the cadence, the grammar, all those things we can literally see when there are errors. And it seems that fine art, and fine art alone, sculpture, painting, installation, video, sound, is the only medium that has been relegated into the deep realms of utter subjectivity. Um, in no other medium, case in point, in no other medium have I heard somebody remark, this is a pivotal masterpiece. And my kid could do that about the same piece. <laughs> okay, take this Google search I did uh, of bad art. <laughs> okay, these are some of the ones that have appeared on the first page. Uh, this is one of my favorites here. Um, now, a lot of these come from the Museum of Bad Art in Somerville, Massachusetts. Uh, and I like a lot of these. I think that they're cute and funny and accessible. And clearly, I'm not the only one, since they have an entire museum dedicated to bad art, right? Um, and if there's a museum, and if there's an audience, isn't that some measure of success, right? Now, I think the reason why this is such a sore subject for me is because my job, my very role as a contributing member of society really hinges on the fact that there must be a value system for art. There has to be good and bad art. We have to be able to hold up one piece as better than another. Otherwise, how are we to learn from that? How are we to grow? And then what the heck would the foundation of my business be? Okay. Um, so, before I dive into a few of the reasons why I think judging art has become so subjective, um, first I'd like to do a really quick exercise with everyone. Uh, you'll see that there's a piece of paper provided, a little sheet there. Do you see that? Looks, looks like this right here. Okay, and you also have a little marker as well provided there. And just for a few minutes here, not too long, I'd really love us to try and draw a portrait. Okay? And I'd, just for ease, I'd like that portrait to be a self-portrait. Please. And try to make it good. Okay? I know our skills are all different. Okay? Uh, I like to put up this meme, my, one of my favorites, of Mr. Rogers. Because it doesn't, it doesn't matter. We're just trying to... It's a safe space. We're just having fun. So, please, a self-portrait. I'll give you a couple minutes. Please aim, aim to try and make it good. Oh, looking good, everyone. I see some eyes, I see a nose. That's good. <laughs> Looks just like you spit an image. Oh, nice. Some, some of us using our, f our phones as reference. 
Fantastic. Oh, very nice. The hair. Keep it. the hair is excellent. The hair is excellent. Really good. Very good. <laughs> I like it. Oh, very good. Nice. Some glasses there. I see that. Very interesting. Some of us opting for going from the inside of the face out. And others, the shell, the head first. Really good. Really good. Nice. Oh, nice. Doing a dissection, a breakdown of the head. Excellent. Oh, great. Truman, may I? <laughs> Thank you. Great. All right, about one more, one more minute. So wrap up those final details on the face. <laughs> no, it's good. <laughs> oh, Toadie, very nice. Very, very nice. Oh, Mark, very nice. Okay. All right, let's wrap up. I'd like everybody to just hold up their drawing, please. Thank you. Oh, lovely. Oh, everyone's looking so cute. I love it. Maybe take a little just a turny turn so other people can see. Wow. Can I borrow your instrument? Thank you. Very, very nice. It was like everybody's heads just popped off and you held them up. Thank you so much. Thank you for doing that with me. Um, what I've noticed, and you know, I think what we'll notice is that nearly all of us, with the exception of one or two, opted for realism or an attempt at realism. Okay. Uh, and why is that? Why didn't some of us do, or most of us do, a, a textured blur to represent the self, or a symbol, perhaps? And a few of us did. Why didn't we do like a multi-layered crosshatch to represent how multi-layered we are, right? No, instead, we went for realism. And, you know, it's understandable that representational art is still our go-to when we strive for good, quality art. So why does mimetic or realistic imagery dominate what we perceive as good art? Okay, what we strive for when our pens hit the paper? Well, I think a lot of that has to do with Jesus. Okay? <laughs> now, this is uh, one of my favorite pictures, earliest images of Jesus, and I like it because he looks like he's a, uh, whoops, sorry. <laughs> That's for later. Uh, he looks like he's giving me a little wink, and I, and I like it. So, for centuries, the Western world painted Jesus and his friends and family. Okay, and even when we stopped painting Jesus, uh, we painted people who looked like him. And it makes sense, considering art's purpose at the time. People needed a visual icon of their values in their homes and churches. And painting Jesus was part of that worship. It was part of the dedication, the time to make his image a reality. Okay? Not altogether dissimilar from some of the fan art, maybe some of us did when we were young as well, of our teen idol heartthrobs. Okay? Uh, and we maybe hung those, I know I did, in my locker, or we slid them on our binders and carried them around. This is a... Um, drawing that my partner Connor did for his sister Shannon on her 12th birthday of her favorite band, Hanson. Uh, well, let's get real, it's probably their favorite band, Hanson. Okay. And my thoughts, ultimately, this is not good. <laughs> but from the point of view of realism, it's not half bad. And not because it approaches verisimilitude because a photograph can do that, 
right? And Connor could have just easily given his sister the photo reference of Hanson, which would have been much better in terms of accuracy. But no, this is a visual document of his time and dedication. A realistic portrait is desired, translated through the hand. The expression of devotion and skill that shows the blood, sweat, tears, and hours put into, in this case, each individual strand of blonde hair on Taylor's head. Okay, and this time spent is part of that worship. It's something sacred, meditative. I use the term adding pain in my consultations with artists, and it represents uh, when, when we make something more difficult than it has to be, this added self-imposed complexity or unnecessary labor to make something seem good or better. Time is one of those things. Portraiture especially is a great example of how highbrow art is intrinsically tied to realism and the economy of art. The function of painting at the time was documentation, making a record. This is me, this is my family, this is our stuff, right? And because of the centuries-long association of fine art and religion to economy, realism still monopolizes how we teach and learn about art history in the Western world. And then came modernism. Yes, I know many things happen in the hundreds of years in between, but I only have so much time up here, so if you bear with me, we're gonna go through the world's fastest version of a art history timeline. So we're starting with Jesus, Jesus and his friends, paintings of rich people, paintings of poor people, some fruit, some boats, and boom, modernism. Okay. And modernism said, Forget about Jesus and his pals. Let's paint squares. <laughs> okay. And so people painted squares for a very long time. And not just squares, but friends of squares. So, like the line, uh -huh. the circle, the breaky break, the twisty twist, and the splashy splash. Okay, so, and then, after another hundred years, some guy decided to put a row of horses' asses on the wall and it broke the internet. <laughs> and because of all these huge shifts from realism to modernism, constructivism to postmodernism and conceptual art, the definition of what makes good art has become super muddled, okay? Or even what art is at all has become muddled. Now, another reason that we might find it so difficult to measure the quality of art is because fine art, the fine art world comes with a level of snobbery and elitism, one that is completely deliberate. There's a reason why our top museums and galleries present as white cubes that are cold and minimalist, with tall ceilings and nearly nothing in them. Uh, it's to keep it elusive, to keep it associated with the expensive, with scarcity, um, only open to the chosen few, out of reach. Now, to judge art, to deem a piece good or bad or somewhere in between, would be to subscribe to this world. To say that you, indeed, are a well-cultured person who knows why great and important works of art include a crucifix immersed in urine, or why a mattress immersed in urine, stained with urine, or a canvas splattered with urine. To be able to judge art would mean that you know the answer to one of the greatest art world questions of our time. Why is there so much urine? <laughs> <clears throat> so, to claim this would be bold. So instead, we default to the ever-popular, ever-overused line, I don't know if it's good art, but I know what I like. The safe zone, which again reinforces that taste is subjective and anything goes. 
The, these disclaimers, though, however, mask the real issues, which is that the art world continues to deliberately make itself intimidating and unattainable. The result is a culture of ignorance to questions like, is this good or bad? And even that question, is this good or bad, is broken because it still falls within a binary system. Good, bad, beautiful, ugly. These are the only two choices. And like anything without a nuanced vocabulary or other options or gray area, these make for ineffective and frankly, very boring conclusions. So hopefully by now, you have a little glimpse into some of the reasons why good art has become so relative and thus nearly impossible to judge. So instead of trying to reconcile an impossible task, I'd really like to share with you some of the reasons that I, some of the ways that I critique art in my uh, consultations with artists on a daily basis. So my working definition of good art involves three parameters, intention, practice, and context. Now, I love me a good Foucault and Barthes, but I think for me, intention still matters. So if an artist's goal makes a goal and achieves that goal, I think that counts for something. Perhaps their goal is to create something easy on the eyes, soothing to the soul, a, a seascape, a floral, a landscape, maybe a muted color form. Great. Or perhaps their goal is to create something quite the opposite of that. Something repulsive, something provocative and challenging. Maybe something with a little urine. Great. Or maybe their aim is to experiment or explore a new process. Perhaps it's to just enjoy or exhaust a new medium. Artists have many aims. And some degree of quality can be measured by whether those aims are missed, met, or exceeded. And it may seem like setting the intention is the easy part and uh, fulfilling it is the tough part. Well, in my experience with our clients, it's almost always the other way around. So, and that is, I think, because there's just so many things distracting us in the world. Okay, clouding our judgments and presenting us with too many confusing and uh, just too many options, okay? Ones that poke at our inner critic, right? Uh, I'm talking about things like other people, media, Instagram. So for instance, one of the most common complaints I hear or one of the most common issues we deal with in our consultations from our realism spectrum artists, those that work in any precise medium, I'm talking about illustrators, those with a geometric practice, or uh, anybody who like, works tightly. Their goal always is to loosen up. They want to get loose and uh, you know, show some more marks and get a little messier. Why? Because they think that's contemporary. And without it, they're stuck in the past and boring. So they try to get loose and go against the thing that they're truly very good at. On the other side of the spectrum, we have our loose artists, the ones that are working in a mark-making, splishy-splashy, loose medium. And they're feeling insecure about needing to get tighter, okay? They want to show more detail because no, it couldn't possibly be this easy, right? They feel they need to justify their practice somehow, right? And so they do weird stuff, like they add in like weird detail or they decide they're just gonna now start making their own paint from crushed blueberries that they've sourced from this bush that's been pollinated by these bees that they're good friends with. <laughs> okay, adding pain, right? Both sides heed to the pressure that the work must be harder than it is to make it good. So, figuring out your intention is key. The second is practice. Since in order to hit a target, you have to show up. Being passionate and talented is just not enough. You have to do the homework, okay? And that really means just finding out 
which is, what is the best tool for the job and striving towards a mastery of that tool. A big part of your practice, of the practice part, is also understanding the canon that you're working in. Okay, and how, if at all, that canon relates to the time that you're living in. Okay, in other words, the zeitgeist. And in order to understand that zeitgeist, you have to also see the bigger picture of who has come before you, so artists have paved the way. Who is working alongside of you at this very moment? And who is forging ahead? Which brings me to my last piece of criteria, which is also maybe the most interesting, given how much artists are held up as one-of-a-kind individual geniuses, because this last piece is one that we can't fully control, and that is context. Now, there are plenty of examples in art history of famous works that aren't particularly impressive in terms of practice, so the skill level involved, right? But they've made an impact because they, they broke the mold, defied convention, really defined what it means to be avant-garde. Take one of my bucket list pieces, for example, Manet's Olympia. Now, there are many aspects to this piece like, for example, the way it's painted, all the symbols that are hidden within, her dirty shoes, her gaze, the flowers, etc., that make this seemingly unexceptional piece a trailblazer. And yes, it was Manet's intention to stick it to the 19th century man uh, when he painted it, and that he did, but he couldn't have known or controlled where it would go from there. All he could do, and all we can do as artists, is figure out the rules and then decide if they need breaking. So Manet understood his audience, he understood the trends, and that helped him refine his intention and drive his practice. So, I'm going to leave you with one final story to illustrate the importance of context. And it's a bit of a sad tale, and it starts in the 1830s with two Frenchmen. Oops, there we go. Two Frenchmen and their race to invent photography. Okay. Well, not exactly photography, but the photograph, and thus photography as we know it today. Their names are Louis Daguerre and Hippolyte Bayard. Okay, now how many of you have heard of a daguerreotype? Okay, quite, quite a few. How many of you have heard of a Bayardogram? Yes? I don't know how, because I just made that word up. <laughs> I made that word up right now, so I think we know who won that race. Yes? Daguerre. But the way he won it was in a bit of an underhanded way. Okay. He persuaded, uh, well, he didn't persuade. He asked one of his benefactors, a friend, to pretend to be a benefactor of Bayard and persuade him to hold off on patenting his process just long enough for Daguerre to slip in and patent it before him by like a day. Okay. And thus, we have the daguerreotype and Louis Daguerre goes down in the history books as the father of photography and Bayard is barely a footnote, basically a total loser. At least in one respect, because to me, this story shows how history can leave big losers as winners in another way. See, Bayard not taking this very well, he staged a bit of a publicity stunt, um, where uh, a very self-indulgent publicity stunt, where he, he did a self-portrait as a drowned man, okay, uh, uh, and claimed that he was this lowly, unclaimed corpse that nobody wanted and that, uh, yeah, that he had taken his own life and now is this drowned man. He also wrote a very melodramatic rant to go along with it, uh, in the third person, of course. And it goes like this. The corpse which you see here is that of Monsieur Baird, inventor of the process that's just been shown to you. As far as I know, this indefatigable experimenter has been occupied for about three years with his discovery. The government, 
which has been all too generous to Monsieur Daguerre, has said it can do nothing for Monsieur Bayard, and the poor wretch has drowned himself. Oh, the vagaries of human life! He has been at the morgue for several days, and no one has recognized or claimed him. Ladies and gentlemen, you better pass along for the fear of offending your sense of smell, for as you can observe, the face and hands of the gentleman are beginning to decay. So Baird also rubbed uh, white makeup on his hands and face to really hammer home the, the dead corpse effect. So the result of this initially, nothing much. Okay, but in time, people began to recognize Baird's photo as a major accomplishment. He had inadvertently hit upon a very significant first, and that is the first artistic self-portrait in photography. Okay. Um, you know, people used photography from the get-go to take portraits, you know, to document the self, but to create a fictional narrative to tell a story, it wouldn't be for another hundred years before that would happen and before it would become a very stable subgenre of fine art photography, the self-portrait. The second amazing thing that Baird did was he also destabilized the notion of photographic truth, objective truth, um, that's connected to a photograph. Um, and problematic as it may be, even still today, we associate photos with truth. People have written hundreds of thousands of books and articles about its association and how we still do that. Here, hundreds of years ago, Matt, uh, Bayard was already doing that, questioning it, manifesting this question in his false narrative as a drowned man who was very much alive. And finally, as luck would have it, his Woe is Me project uh, he also inadvertently stumbled upon, I think, inventing emo. <laughs> okay. So there's something very strangely modern, of course I've emotified this, right? Uh, I think there's something very strangely modern about this photograph of Bayard, even in the fact that it's square, okay? Which to me is really reminiscent of Instagram, okay? And it makes me think, of um, basically our millennial and Gen Z culture and their obsession or, or a preoccupation with self-display and emotional drama. Okay. So I believe this is a good piece of art. Well, not this, but you know, this, okay, is a good piece of art. And I can say that with confidence exactly why. Intention practice, and context. It was Bayard's intention to create a dramatic display of how he was wronged. Check. In practice, in terms of skill, he basically invented photography here, right? So we, we got to give him that one. Check. And in terms of contextual relevance, context, well, we're talking about him today, and we're linking him with self-portraiture, the pioneering of self-portraiture in photography. We are linking him with questioning truth in photography. And I'm linking him with emo culture. Okay. So, check. And because the context couldn't, he couldn't have known that Bayard at that time, right? It wasn't on his radar. All he could do was continue to plug away and live his life and not roll over and die in a ditch like he's pretending he did. Right. Uh, he continued to make advances in the photographic sciences. He put on photo shows. Uh, he joined uh, photo clubs and collectives as well. Basically, to return to today's theme, Bayard continued to do the critical work, the essential work of pursuing and developing his practice. So even though we understand that art is extremely subjective, and perhaps now we know a bit more as to why, my hope is that we don't stop there, that we don't give in to it, okay? that we don't have to drown in it as I felt I have many times. Because I want to say that it's not only possible, but necessary and critical 
for us to rise above that, to rise above this attitude of these anti-critical stance, because we now have the tools to do so. Today, I've shared with you my tools, intention, practice, and context, and I hope that you use those tools next time you're looking at a piece of art, or even better, maybe to create your own set of criteria, your own standards for what you're looking at and how to decide whether that's good or bad, to apply it in an active way. Because I think in doing so, we can take back our autonomy and our agency as art critics. And I'm saying art critics in the best way, in the best way of that word. Open-minded, but discerning. Convicted and considerate. Immersed, devoted. Instead of remaining passengers just along for the ride, we can in this way become engaged, active participants again in making meaning from artwork. So think of it this way. We passionately speak about our own opinions on music, on movies and TV. We live or die by one TV series and not another, and we can say exactly why. In fact, we're begging people to ask us why. Okay. I want us to speak that way about art. I want to bring that same passionado back into talking about art. To not only say that you love or hate a piece, but to be able to explain why. I'd really love to reclaim lines like, I don't know good art, but I know what I like. And instead, I'd like to replace them with, I know what makes good art, and I know what I love. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.